Hi, and welcome to my tutorials on Euclid's Elements, Book 5. This video presentation is going to be on Proposition 17 of Book 5. Now before we begin, we have some more definitions. Definition 14 and 15. The componendo ratio of A to B. So we have a ratio A to B. And the componendo ratio of A to B is we take the sum of the consequent and the antecedent and compare it to the consequent. So in other words, the componendo ratio is A plus B to B. The separando ratio of A to B, now we take the difference between A and B. So the separando ratio of A to B is A minus B compared to B. So this is the definition of the componendo ratio and the separando ratio. So what is this proposition? This proposition starts with, we have two magnitudes, A to B compared to E to B, C to D compared to F to D. These two ratios are equal. If these two ratios are equal, then the difference between the two, AB, minus EB, in other words, AE, AE to EB would be equal to CF to FD. Because I find it difficult myself to keep track of the AB and EB and which line is which line, I have rewritten this proposition using single characters to represent a magnitude. And basically what this proposition is saying, if we have two ratios, A to B and C to D, that are equal. Then the componendo ratio, or sorry, the separando ratio, A minus B to B, will also be equal to C minus D to D. So this, I find, personally, a simpler way to view what this proposition is trying to prove. So here go, let's prove it. A to B is to E to B as C to D is to F of D. That is our starting condition. Now we start creating new magnitudes, GH, HK, LM, and MN, which are equal multiples of AE, EB, CF, and FD, respectively. So we actually are having a set of four magnitudes that are equal multiples to another set of four magnitudes. Now we're creating two new magnitudes, KO and NP, which are a different equal multiple of EB and FD. They're di different equal multiple of EB and FD. All right, now if you recall from proposition one, if we have two magnitudes, AE and EB, and we have another two magnitudes, GH and HK, which are equal multiples of the first two, so GH and HK are equal multiples of AE and EB, then the sum of these will be the same equal multiple. In other words, GH plus HK will also be the same multiple of AE plus EB as the original. In other words, we have GH, HK is equal to this equation here, and from that, GH plus HK, which is GK, will be equal to M times AE plus EB, in this case, is AB. So this comes from proposition one. Similarly, LM and MN are equal multiples of CF and FD. So if we add everything together, LM plus MN will be the equal, same equal multiple of CF plus FD. In other words, we have LN is equal to M times CD. But now when we constructed GH and HK and LM and MN, it was all part of a set of the same, the same multiple. So since everything is the same multiple, 
we end up that GK and LN are equal multiples of AB and CD. Now let's look at HK and KO. HK is a multiple of EB. KO is a multiple of EB. So HO is also a multiple of EB, and in this case it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So HO is M plus N times EB. But similarly, M plus N, or sorry, MN and NP are multiples of FD. So MN plus NP, or in other words, MP, will be a multiple of FD, and it will also be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times FD, or M plus N. So we have that HO and MP are multiples of EB and FD, respectively. But not only are they multiples, they are equal multiples. So we have HO and MP are equal multiples of EB and FD. Now, according to the definition 5, of what it means for two ratios to be equal. If A to B, sorry, if AB to EB is equal to CD to FD, the definition of what this means to be equal is written in this equation here, where we have if there's a multiple of AB greater than the different multiple of EB, that would imply that the same multiple of CD would also be greater than the other multiple of FD. So if M times AB is greater than K times EB, that implies that M times CD would also be greater than K times FD. If it's equal, they'd be equal. If it's less than, it's less than. Now remember, this is the definition of what it means for two ratios to be equal. Well, m, k can be any two integers we want, but let's use the ones where we have defined g, k, and l, p, and so on and so forth. So m times a, b is equal to g, k. k times e, b is equal to h, o. m times c, d is l, n. And k times f, d is m, p. So now we're basically saying if GK is greater than HO, then that means that LN is greater than MP. So I've just rewritten this here. I was running out of space. So I've just rewritten this here from the previous page. Previous page, just rewriting it. So let's look at the case where GK is greater than HO, which implies that LN is greater than MP. So GK is greater than HO implies that LN is greater than MP. A lot of dancing around these lines. Well, what is GK? Let's subtract HK from this equation from both sides. So we take GK minus HK is greater than HO minus HK. So we're having GH be greater than KO. Let's take LN minus MN and MP minus NN. We would now have that LM is greater than NP. So what we've done is we've taken this generic equation, and in this case we've subtracted HK from both sides of the inequality, and here we've taken MN from both sides of the 
inequality. So basically what we have is, if this relationship is true, simplifying it, we have if GH is greater than KO, LM is greater than NP, or equal to or less than as the case may be. So GH is equal to M times AE, KO is N times EB. LM is M times CF, NP is N times FD. Well, if we have this equation here, remember from definition 5, this is the definition for two ratios to be equal. And since this is the definition, it is essentially saying that AE to EB is equal to CF to FD. And remember that AE is actually equal to AB minus EB. So ultimately, a little long-winded, we have that if AB to EB is equal to CD to FD, here, we have that AB minus EB to EB is equal to CD minus FD is to FD. Or in other words, this relationship here. The first time I went through this proof, it took me a while to sort out all the little nitty gritties because there's a lot of points and there's a lot of magnitudes that are overlapping. So if you're having trouble understanding this particular proposition or proof of proposition, just rerun the video and go through it slowly. And what I found helpful was to actually just look at the math as opposed to looking at the lines because the lines I find were a bit confusing. If you'd like to know why I did this way, I'm doing it this way because this is the way it was done in Euclid's book, and I'm trying to follow Euclid's proofs. So good luck with this one. And um, Proposition 18 is sort of the inverse of this, so we're going to have some more fun with Proposition 18. And that concludes this video presentation. To see the next presentation, just click the next button.